My Expat Taxes is the most trusted software for U.S. expats. Filing from abroad can be complicated, but My Expat Taxes makes it simple with their award-winning software. E-file instantly and chat with U.S. expat tax specialists. No tax situation is too complicated. Welcome to Global Take, presented by School Rubric, a show about the international teaching experience. Teaching internationally is one of the best decisions you can make as an educator. In this show, we will meet teachers and administrators from around the globe, living and working internationally. Our hope is that their stories and experiences will inspire you to explore the world of education. We will learn about all aspects of international teaching, from becoming an international teacher, to what countries are the best fit for you, to the challenges of being away from your home country. Come take this unforgettable journey to the world of international schools with Global Take, presented by School Rubric. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this edition of Global Take. Uh, my name is Nick DeForest. I'm coming to you from Vienna, Austria, and I'm excited about this episode. We're going to do things a little bit different than normal. We're going to dive into an article. So we'll discuss um, a lot of great things in this article. Um, and we'll, of course, have our, our panel discussion. So uh, it's about the visibility of female coaches in international schools. Yeah. Coaching in general, big topic, getting coaches, uh, retaining coaches, but specifically female coaches as role models for our female athletes. Uh, the article was written by Laura Davies and Sadie Hollins, and it was published on Phys Equity. Um, we'll see that great resource there. Um, should check that website out if you haven't. Just had a name change. Um, so, so please, after the show, go there. But this article was based on a survey they did about a year ago. Uh, talking about what the makeup is like of coaches at your schools and how we can best get the right um, role models for our young female athletes. So uh, I won't do that by myself. Of course, we have a great panel um, on with me today. I'd like to introduce them. Hi, everybody. Uh, you will recognize veteran uh, Kathy Tango on, uh, a veteran of Global Take. She is the Student Activities Director at the Brent International School in Manila. And then uh, rookies today, we have John Powell. <laughs> He's the athletics and activities director at the American School of Brasilia. And John will also do the school spotlight tonight at the end. So we're putting him right to work. And uh, last, of course, but not least, Mariana de Carvalho. And currently right now, a PE teacher and coach, but also former athletic director. She's at the St. John's International School in Waterloo. So thank you very much for taking the time being here with us. Um, I gave you obviously the name and the intro, but we want to get to know you a little bit. Um, so let's start off with uh, telling the viewers and, and ourselves uh, which teams you've coached. Yeah. And what's the makeup of your current coaching staff at your school? So uh, Mariana, can you kick us off? Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm Portuguese and in Portugal, handball, it's a big sport. I've been a handball player since I'm a child and I've became a handball coach at 15. And for several years, I was coaching handball in a club setting. So not in a, not at school uh, or not only at school. And I was also a PE teacher, but on the side uh, in clubs from uh, 10 years old to 18 years old, I've coached uh, girls and boys in different clubs. Um, I've moved uh, to Belgium, where I'm working now uh, in 2012 to finish my PhD by then. And after I became a member of the international schools setting from 2015, where I was working in the sports athletic department uh, as and uh, the couple of years at the end as an AD. So I think it's interesting that I have this vision from the side of the mm -hmm. coaching and from the side of uh, the athletics director. And finally, now I moved into St. John's International School, also in Brussels, Belgium. And I've been um, an assistant coach of the high school football girls. And uh, I'm also with our primary girls football 
team coming up to middle school, so I'm preparing the, the youngsters to become part of the middle school team. Uh, in relation to the numbers of our school, yeah. Um, yeah. so we we have at the moment we have 33 coaching positions, and of these, mm -hmm. about eight are filled by women, and then plus two where you have the physical coach and the physiotherapist. So in total, will be 10 uh, 10 female staff members in uh, coaching in 35 that's less than 30 percent and i think we will talk a little bit more about this later yeah. but uh it's a uh, very it, it has been very difficult for our ad here and also when i was working in the previous mm -hmm. school to find some females i know we will talk about yeah. those reasons of course but great thanks thanks very much um and john the other new guy what's uh Hear from you. Morning. Thank you, Nick and Global Take, for having me on. I um, I have 12 years international teaching experience. Uh, when it came to coaching, I started at a collegiate level and uh, graduate assistant for men's basketball at my university. But once I moved to Mexico, my first international stint, I coached the girls' varsity basketball team. I was the head of the basketball program where I've also coached the boys. I've worked with the soccer team, volleyball teams, and slowly moved into the athletic coordinator position. Uh, currently, I not coach at my school in Brasilia, and we have an athletic staff of 24 coaches, six of which are female and 18 are male, and this is mixed across the six sports that we have in our semester this season. Okay, so even less than Mariana. Um, okay, uh, Kathy. Round us off. Hi, yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, so I was actually hired to my school now, which is Brent International School in Manila in the Philippines. Um, I was hired as the baseball coach, and so that's how I came in. I ended up also coaching volleyball. I'm assistant coach for the varsity girls team, and I also i am head coach of the varsity softball team. Um, but as an AD, I also fill in other places like I've traveled for baseball when my coaches couldn't make it. So I became head coach for that. So I, I kind of spot coach where I'm needed. Mm -hmm. um, we are completely online, but the last figures I had for when we were in person um, of 40 head coaches, 25% were female, not a great ratio because I have a difficult time um, finding female coaches. Of our 48 assistant coaches, 35% are female. Um, I'll give you quickly figures from our, our APAC tournament as well. Um, we start off with the 80s, 12 ADs, three of whom are female. Um, for volleyball, we have good percentages. So 50% were female mm -hmm. and 67 of those were head coaches. So that's a pretty good um, ratio. For softball, not as good, 31% female, um, only 25% of those were head coaches. And for basketball, it dropped even further. 33% were female and 17 of those were head coaches. So volleyball, the clear leader there with regards to female coaches. Yeah. You mentioned that the, the conference, they, they talk about that in the article as well, is this, you know, not just in your school, but, but conference-wide, right? Where they were the only females showing up to a female uh, soccer tournament. Um, right. Here in, uh, in, at, in Vienna, we have uh, 28 coaches right now for our fall season. That's up and running, uh, games starting soon. Uh, and 13 of the 28 are, are female, so really almost half. And actually five of our seven high school teams are led by female coaches. So five of the seven head coaches in the high school are, are female. So I think um, pretty, pretty good numbers, especially okay. compared to you guys, yeah. Well, that's great. Great um, kicking us off, letting everyone know where you know where we're and kind of where we're at. Um, I want to just, John, we're gonna we're gonna step to the side a little bit because the article uh, starts with a story of disrespect um, to to these two female coaches, Laura and Sadie, uh, by a male coach. So I just wondered, uh, Mariana and uh, Kat, do you have any similar experiences as as being female female coaches? Um, Mariana, would you would you kick us off? Sure. Uh, so I, just to, to give a little bit of a background, I come from a family that is very open minded and progressive. And I, I grew up not even knowing what that was until I actually stepped into the outside world. Uh, but always uh, I always I was raised to fight for my place and for my beliefs. And but also in a very hippie style, trying to find the best in every person. So I might a lot of negative details in my life might have escaped because I was always trying to find the good things in life, sure. if you know what I mean, not not really taking care of those details. But I do have a story when I was uh, a, a really young coach, 
I started as a as a coach of a young team of girls. They were all beginners. Mm -hmm. The parents were so familiar. Everything was nice and all good. Following year, mm -hmm. I go to a big handball club in Portugal, one of the ones that wins the National League. And I was coaching boys, so right. the future stars, supposedly. Um, but they were, didn't have a lot of talent, but they thought that they were very good just because they were at that club. Actually, they yeah. didn't want to work hard. And I did struggle with that team, but also a lot with the parents. They would scream from the stands when we would be losing. They were totally against my strict rules because I wanted them to work and the kids were not so much into working hard. And I had terrible times. And at that point, I thought it was because I was young. But now I know that they wouldn't have done it if it was a young guy coaching. So they were really against me in a lot of things. Everything I would do was wrong. They they criticized, they knew nothing about handball, but they criticized my methodologies. And I do think it was a lot because I was a woman. Now I, I know that. By then I was just like, oh, I'm young, I'm still learning, right, maybe right. they are right. And I have another story that is really funny. My, my sister, she's also in handball, and she just became a first league uh, coach in a national first division, so high level. Huh? Mm -hmm. She has an assistant coach who is a man, and uh, the refs and the other coaches, when they come to yeah. greet them, they always go to him. And he has to yeah. say, uh, I'm not the main coach. She is the main coach. They have to say it constantly. Even in repeated games, they always have as default that he is the main coach. Yeah. And yeah, that's just cultural, of course. Yeah. Terrible. Yeah, for sure. For sure. <laughs> I'm sure, Kat, you have something similar. Yeah, and I'm going to go out of order for what I was going to do, but because of what Mariana said, um, one of my veteran coaches, Coach Baker, she's awesome, came from the international school scene, and now she's coaching for me. She's terrific. She also said the same thing that Mariana just said, that um, automatically, whether it's a, a coach from an, um, an opposing team or a um, referee, and they will go first to her male assistant coach and they will talk to the male first, even if she's the one asking the questions. Okay, so so she feels that because I consulted some of my female coaches. Um, but for me more, I feel, so the article starts out with a father saying, I'm sorry, I misjudged you. So in my experience, I actually feel a bit more misjudged or underestimated, especially since I started out as a baseball coach. The assumption was that I didn't know anything about baseball because I was a female. Um, and so the, the question is, I mean, you asked also, how did I deal with that? Um, what I did was I studied the game really well and I tried to know everything about it. And it get, got to the point where I knew the rules and I could recite the rule book to you. And that gave me confidence and strength and, and you know, a feeling that nobody can put one over on me or try to manipulate the outcome of a play or a game is because I knew the rules. And so that would be my advice to, to female coaches um, is to know the rules much better than your opponent. And it really makes you, it, it allows you to stand up for, you know, what is right. But I, I was very much disrespected. I'm still sparting from it up till now. And this was by a male umpire. Okay. And, and this was, it brought to light to me, not just the gender bias, but also a cultural bias. And I probably, maybe I shouldn't be saying this, but um, there is, especially in Asia, you know, a certain cultural bias, especially if you're in a country where speaking up is prohibited. And so what more if you're speaking up and you are a female and you're going against authority, um, it is, you know, a loss of face maybe for that male. And so I think that's another component that we have to deal with is, is a cultural, um, you know, that cultural aspect. So gender and, and culture. I actually got the hand, literally hand in my face. This umpire would not even let me speak. It was, I'm, I'm still mad up till this day. So. Yeah, unfortunately, and you know, you talk about in those those head coaching roles with the male counterparts. Are you coaching a boys' a baseball team even even more so? It's, yeah, I, unfortunate. Um, yes, please. Uh, just a comment to what Cassie is saying. Um, it, you were advising people to know the game very well when we yeah. are females, and that's one of the things that happens is that we have to be better than our that than the males because we need to prove ourselves all the time. 
of course, that's a, actually a good thing because if you know all the rules and if you know all the strategies and if you know the game very well, that's only good for us. But to be to be considered as a good coach, you need to be way better than the average of the male coaches. Otherwise, everything every, every mistake you do, it's like oh, it's because she's a woman. Right. Yeah, and that's right. Right. Yeah. right. Well, um, before we dig in, we we have some quotes and some you know there's some recommendations and points in the article that we're going to talk directly about. Um, but I just want to say, if you're if you're out there and you're watching, definitely leave a comment. You saw a few comments pop up. There's Sharon. We know she's tuning in, and uh, we heard from Claudia, uh, who's also uh, in Brazil right now. So um, <laughs> thanks for tuning in, and yeah, drop any questions, comments uh, as we as we go through. Um, but yeah, I want to kick it to quote number one um, from the article, and then when we come back, we'll we'll discuss the quote. We genuinely believe that girls need to see females playing and coaching sport more. We are able to empower them in a way that male coaches cannot, because they do not know what it's like to be underrepresented, underestimated, and overlooked. Yeah, that's, that's it right there, right? Something you guys have already been touching on. So, um, John, I want to go to you first, because obviously we're, we've been quiet here for a little bit. So uh, I want to get your opinion on... Yeah, on that quote. Yeah, I can, well, I can definitely agree that male coaches can't empower um, young female students the way female coaches can. Thus, uh, you know, there's a need to support in the hiring process, training of male coaches to understand these situations, but also giving more opportunity for female coaches on staff. You know, male coaches can work on that empowering techniques that females, um, <clears throat> because they can learn a lot through the female staff, you know, so those development sessions, press professional development coaches sessions can come a lot in handy. Thanks. Yeah. Mariana, how about you? Um, I, I half agree with this because again, I'm a positive person and I believe that there's a lot of men who are on the right side of equality and they yeah. have the right values and they transmit those right values. So I mm. do think that it's very important to have female coaches more for the representation itself. And as Laura and Sadie say in the second part after that, that quote you had, there's the, the next yeah. sentence and it says, I'm not saying that male coaches can't also do this, but when it's only male coaches they see and learn from, of course it will reinforce the perspective that sport remains a male arena on which women cannot truly be considered equal. I think that's the point that is very important is seeing it and, and seeing it as a normal thing, as a yeah. common thing. As you only see men, you're like, mm, okay, that's the normal thing to right. happen. I'm, I, I don't believe that all men are, it, it's the same that we all thinking that we cannot uh, fight for equal rights in, in groups that we are not minorities. I, I believe in equality in, to all the groups and I, I try to fight for it, even if I'm not a minority in some sense. And I think men can also help a lot in this. I do think it's the representative is, representativity is seeing it and having that as a, oh, that's common. I can also be it. Absolutely. Kat. Right. Um, I'm going to quote my coach Baker again, um, because she was saying that when you have a male coach and they're coaching, they draw from their own experiences, which are very, very different from the female experiences. And, and so that representation also is, is important to her. Um, she feels that even if, let's say, both teams win the championship, the male team gets more importance. And so, you know, that's that's one of the biases. Um, what else did, well, on for my part, I feel that as a female coach, yes, they get to see, as Mariana said, they'll grow up thinking that's normal and not abnormal. It's not a men's world. Um, so I think that's very important. And I see it more so actually as an athletic director. I've had so many of my players come up to me and say, I want to do what you do. I, I want to be a coach and I want to be an athletic director. What they don't know is that when I walk into a room, let's say it's a big NIAAA conference or something, what they don't know is that when I walk into the room, I am the 25% of the females that are ADs, not the 75% of the males that you know uh, make up the, the general population. But at least they don't see that and they think if you can see it you can be it because they see me and they think okay i can be that so yes representation is is great right especially at your school right when they see you all the time and interacting and how how great you are um, of course i i agree as well and i think 
specifically for motivating uh, new or younger athletes to, to participate, uh, it's even more important than maybe on the, on the top level, you know, because with, you get to the higher levels, maybe even outside of high school, at least maybe they'll have that internal drive to keep playing and, and keep working hard for themselves. But um, for the beginners, you know, we want everyone at our school to, to play sports and maybe there's some, you know, unathletic people haven't really tried before. And if they see that, you know, their female uh, teacher or coach out there and, and encouraging them, that'll help them realize they, they can play sports too, you know? So I, yeah, if, yeah I, if I can just add to that, because um, again, Coach Baker was saying that it, it'll show those kids that even after high school, even after college, even as an adult, they can still be participative in that sport. Right. So it is rep representation and encouraging them. Right. Yeah. I, can, I can actually say that uh, one of the things that uh, was hardest, the hardest for me in leaving the position of AD, of athletics director mm -hmm. before, it was a, a very difficult decision because I loved it and because mm. I was thinking ah, one less woman around the table. And we were only with two in 13 or with, with two in, in 15 or more. And then there's only one. And uh, it's, yeah. that, that was something that cost me a lot. I, yeah. I'm very happy with the work that I have now. But I'm thinking, <laughs> man, I was there to, to show that females can do it as well. Yeah, great. <laughs> wow, that's great. Um, we have a, a question coming in from Sharon um, that I'd like to just jump to uh, quickly, I would say. Um, and uh, it's what strategy, you see it there, what strategies have you used to hire more um, female coaches? Uh, John, have you, can I go to you on that one? Do you have, uh, yeah, no problem. I know you were online um, last year, but. Yeah, yeah what, I, what I use a lot is the um, already established female coaches that are in the program to know that maybe they're coming from a club, maybe they've been in the school for a long time and they have connections that, you know, I don't quite see as you know, we transition so much between our, between our schools, but using the staff that's already established, finding those high quality coaches that'll buy into your school's mission, vision statements, and, you know, have that positive impact on your, on your teams and students is something I use as a strategy. Great. Well, we're going to get into that as it's going to touch a little bit more onto that. I think as we as we go on, at least as we do our wrap ups. Um, but I want to uh, show one comment before we get get on because uh, Laura Davies is is watching. Um, so thanks for tuning in as we discuss your your article uh, and Mariana there. She she uh, definitely agrees um, that unfortunately female female coaches are held to that that higher standard. Right? Um, shouldn't be the case, but as you both clearly said, it's it's uh, it's relevant. And that's, it's out there. Um, okay, for uh, the article has four perceived barriers to recruiting female coaches. So there's a couple of sections in there that give some good uh, bullet points and, and things. So we wanna talk about the perceived barriers. So we'll see those kind of scroll along at the bottom. Um, and we want you to read the article too. So we're not gonna give away everything. You should, after this, the link's down below, I think in the, in the description, we should read the whole thing. Um, but John, uh, have you run into any of those issues uh, at your schools? Yes, I have. Uh, for the first issue, family, uh, child care responsibilities, I had an issue that one of my really valuable female coaches for the, it was called the running team, more track team. But, um, you know, I've adapted and modified the practice schedule to fit her needs because, you know, I wanted to retain her. We needed to retain her for the, for the program. Uh, the new school, not so much. Uh, as I'm still getting you know, adjusted to where we are from online to getting back on campus now. Uh, when it comes to that second barrier of cultural factors in Latin America, and as I'm, I'm sure you have you know, Kathy and Mariana speak on Asia and Europe, that you know that it just doesn't normally do women in coaching positions. You know, I've seen some development in Mexico after my 10 years from you know a new uh, Mexican football women's league to, you know, here in Brazil, I believe it's one of the few countries in the world that pay their women's national team and their men's national team on the same standard. As you know, the uh, U.S. women are fighting for that and still in that, right. still in that process. Well, that's great. Um, yeah. thanks, thanks very much. And it, cultural, depending on where you are in the world, is could be even more important, right? Yeah. Um, Kat, how about you? Yeah, that's my issue. A lot of it is the cultural um, sports in the Philippines are, are, are big, but mostly for men, not as much for women. So that's what I deal with. And most of the teachers 
that come in from the Philippines are, are female and not into sports. I have a lot of buy-in for club positions and advisorships for, for other roles, but the cultural barrier is, is big. Um, it's also the last reason, number four there, which is coming on the ticker tape right now, confidence, mm -hmm. confidence and a lack of coaching qualifications. And that's probably be, because sports in the Philippines um, is not that, that great. Um, but e even if I hire from abroad our, our foreign faculty, it's really, really difficult to find a female uh, faculty person who can coach, especially multiple sports. And that's why when I get a coach like the coaches that I have, especially those who have come from the international school system, who have played sports, um, I grab them and I hold on tight. Yeah. 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 Uh, great, great ones. Mariana. You. Uh, I'm going to go and be a little disruptive here. The first one, <laughs> family and child care, should be a barrier to men as well. We are always thinking, ah, this shouldn't be a, a barrier to women. And for me, it's the opposite. Family should always come first. And instead of trying to get to the standard of men who are, oh, I'm, uh, allow, uh, I'm, uh, I'm available at all time because my wife is home taking care of the children or yeah. whatever, which of, of course this is changing. It doesn't happen so much anymore. Sure. But I still think that we have yeah. to change our mindsets. For me, and the older I get, the, the more I believe in this work is you have to love it. You have to enjoy it, but it's something that is there on the side and the family comes first. And that should be the same for men. So when John was saying that you had to do something around the change the schedules because of yeah. a female coach, I think this should be just the norm, trying to get people involved, but keeping their life because the quality of life and how you live with your family should be priority. The, uh, another thing that I had to say was that, for instance, if we are hiring for, I think John touched a little bit on that. If we are hiring from a local community here from, let's say, we want to hire uh, Belgian coaches. Um, it, and that in Portugal is the same. So the, my, for my experience, if you, if you are taking a certificate or a, a degree to coach, mm -hmm. You have, you know, that you are then going to coach uh, uh, girls, uh, female coaches, a lot of times wants to coach girls and in the local clubs, the pay for girl for local for female coaches is lower because wow. female teams don't have so much sponsorships yeah. or mm. they don't give so much importance or some clubs just think that men deserve more money still as an equal pay is there in the world. So yeah. if you are a girl, a football player wanting to be a coach and you look and you're like eh, if i go and yeah. coach girls i get less money than men not fair if i try to coach men i'm I, possibly i won't have so many opportunities because they are looking for men to coach men so i think that sometimes it's a the cultural barrier comes from the beginning not then when you are in it's just like why should i care i'm, I'm not going to be treated equally I, I think that people should keep fighting of course but I think this is one of the reasons. It's just watching to what is happening in society and thinking, I'll just go and work in a supermarket and I'll get more money. Sure. You know. I mean, Which that's the great thing about international schools, uh, for the most part, is that the sports are treated equally, right? We're not wor yes. worried about uh, gate revenue for the big uh, male right. sports or anything, and the coaches are okay. paid equally if the, if they're paid at all. I think I know in our schools that's all different. Um, <laughs> for me, it's uh, we're really lucky. I think here, I, my stats. Have the beginning i said we have so many female coaches and but it's still number four um uh, you know the confidence is i hear that more from female staff members than male you know males if i ask, hey you know you played some basketball what do you think about coaching this boys basketball team you know the answers from the males are usually well i'm not so sure but okay let's give it a try and uh, where i found that from the females in the same it's ooh, i don't yeah i don't think i can do that um because they just don't think they're they're qualified. So maybe going back to what you guys both said at the beginning, that you have to be the, the feeling of you have to be really, really on top of your game, or you're not even gonna, you know, step into the arena. Um, yeah. So yeah, Nick, I mean, I'm gonna back on that one, yeah. Nick. I think too, you know, the we talked about <clears throat> the the connection to looking for qualified coaches within the strategies of you know, using other resources in your program, but also talking about that number three, looking at, you know, HR and your leadership, who's going to the recruitment fairs, that's another strategy. And then also having that teacher who, you know, from the eight to two thirty, three o'clock time frame, do they want to be involved with athletics after school? 
And if they're a woman, a woman in that position, you know, they're even more valuable. But I guess lastly, that lack of confidence yeah. from the quote that we heard about the students wanting to see female coaches, that's our responsibility as athletic directors too, to give our female staff that confidence and show them that, you know, this is an opportunity. This is a chance to grow as well, to challenge yourself. Exactly. Yeah, great. Great, Alan. Thanks for, right. for joining. Yeah, Kat, go ahead. If I can add something, yeah, for, for number three, um, John touched on it also a little bit. Um, I've been luck lucky enough to have a very, very supportive administration, and I actually coordinate every year um, with the person who does the recruiting head of school. And, you know, I'll, I'll give him my, my list of I need this head coach, that head coach. And Every time I always say, you know, female coaches are, are a prime commodity. So all things being equal, if you can hire that person who is a female coach, um, it also saves money economically because if you have a female team and you've got two male coaches there, you're going to have to, especially now because of child safeguarding, you're going to have to send that third chaperone, which is going to cost the school money. So, you know, that's another way you can broach it to your head of school or whoever does the recruiting to, you know, from the get go, try to hire um, a, a faculty person who can also coach and who's female. Yeah, exactly. Well, um, great uh, recommendation from Shelly that you just saw on the screen. Shelly, thanks um, for tuning in. And that's where we're going to go next. Uh, so, Shelly, if you missed it, said about involving high school female um, student athletes to help maybe with middle school teams as, as future role models. Um, the article uh, has four recommendations as well. So after the four barriers, there's four recommendations. Um, they're going to fly uh, along on the bottom here. And uh, we'll talk about, about those and some of our own recommendations. So Kat, I want to go back to you. Um, what's one of your, your main recommendations? Um, well, I, I think uh, John touched on it, um, giving that professional development or helping those female coaches gain that confidence. But, but I think the professional development um, should be both for the males and the female coaches. Um, I think it's very important. That's one of the reasons I got involved in, in course development, um, just in order to bring that, because we don't have a lot of that in Asia. Mm -hmm. um, so I think approaching the female staff, also John touched on that, where he, he'll go and, you know, and, and, and talk to them and try to convince them to do this or to do that. And um, hopefully one of these days that female will say, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll try that. I'll try to be a basketball coach. Um, implementing the codes of conduct, which is also there, um, and and the philosophies. I think, I think most of us do that, and that's probably in our coaching handbook already and pretty clear. Um, but it also helps, you know, the education-based athletic guidelines is to teach not just the female coaches that, but but the male coaches as well. Um, the recommendations, um, I, I kind of jumped the gun there and I said it is just coordinate with whoever's doing the hiring and, and just let it be known how key it is to try to find it. Because finding the male coaches who are faculty will be easier. And so just emphasizing, you know, we need female coaches. Um, and if you can find them, please hire them. Yeah, great. Some great, great recommendations and extensions. John, you were mentioned a few times there. So let's go right to you. Yeah, I'm, I really agree with Kathy on these comments. Um, following up with HR and really trying to find the right, the right coach for the position and using your staff that's that's already established is a great resource. Super, super. Thanks, yeah. Ariana. How about you? Uh, obviously, all of these uh, tips are very good, and what you you guys were saying. Uh, but I go back again to my, something that is very dear to me, which is philosophy and culture. And that has to start from grassroots. And with the, the, um, the, the topic of involving high school students in coaching as well, yeah. that's amazing. But even going lower, as I said at the beginning, I'm, I have a, a football, a primary football girls ECA. We have some games and they get all excited. We started it last year with six or seven girls and now this year we are having 13 and they are so excited because they, have, they can have these games with more people and what I, I i try to get into their minds a lot with hey go and play during recess go and play you, you can the more you practice the better you'll be and you're having fun and there's always this ah but the boys are taking up the playing field or the boys are there or the boys are better I always try to go again. They are better because they play more, especially at this age. There's not such a big difference. Of course, 
older ages it will be different because the physical differences are there but not with under 12s just go and play with them insist that you want to be in a team run to the field and take the field first if you want to play with only with girls but why play with only with girls play with yeah, with boys so. and also these little things with language like uh i need to when a PE teacher that says, I need two strong boys to help me with materials, that all counts. That all gets into their minds. And yeah. it has to start from that age that they know that if they want, they can be whatever they want. Right. They just need to to know a world where it's what that exists. Yeah. And still some people say, uh, ladies first, for instance. I go crazy with the ladies first. <laughs> stop that. Just stop that. There's no, there's just, what, what ladies and no. Uh, you can see that I'm very emotional great. about this. Yeah, this is great. <laughs> no, it's perfect. I had, you know, a very similar conversation with my elementary school daughter who, you know, on the recess, uh, really wanted to play soccer with the boys, uh, but was, you know, her, her other friends wanted to just, you know, be on the monkey bars and I just, just get out there and play. And so now yeah. she's, she does. Uh, so that, that was good. That, my, for me, number two uh, is important. And I think, you know, personal connections, um, personal conversations are always the most important. Uh, and more so in this in this case, right? Really go talk to them. Don't just send an email. Hey, you interested in this? Uh, you know, really have have that conversation and and let them know in that conversation that you're you are there to support them. Maybe educate them if they need some more training, as we mentioned. Um, but really, you know, start uh, start slow, even just as assistant coaches. But get involved, right? Let the students see you out there. Um, so that's that's my uh, main one. And we're, we're almost uh, out of time for our discussion on the article, but we have one more quote um, that we're going to see and, and listen to and then just come back with final thoughts uh, on this one. It's a, it's a good one. It's coming. We would encourage schools to be more aware of the issue of female visibility in international school coaching and to actively seek to appoint and empower female coaches. There must be a drive to increase representation across all levels, which in turn will benefit and empower our female students. Yeah, yeah, really, really good. Um, yeah, part summary of the, of the article at the end and a, a good last um, thought. Do you guys have any last thoughts on this, on this yeah, subject, important uh, subject area? Mariana, I know you've been speaking your mind. I know you have a good one for us. Um, I, I think international schools are actually one of the settings where this happens more uh, already. Okay, so we are in a good place because we are aware of this. We, we want to be part of the solution. And also the international schools uh, philosophy, it's always about equality and everything. So it, 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 we are already ahead of local clubs and local communities. Um, but again, just to finish, just with a sm short story, there's a there's a story that I love, which is about uh, a frog who wanted to climb a mountain, and everyone would go and say, "You can't do it! You can't do it!" And the frog frog would keep going, 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 and he made it. And people came to him, and uh, and uh, they were asking, "How is it possible?" And the frog was deaf, so he couldn't hear people saying, you, "You're not going to be able to make it." And for me, it's just raising little deaf frogs if i if i can say it's just uh, getting the girls used to to know that there will be voices against there will be voices in favor but just like me when i was a kid just don't listen to the negative part or the discrimination or the bullying kind of ignore a little bit more of that of course we have to acknowledge when we are in charge of it but just go for it and yeah again if if it starts in the grassroots if we not only our athletes but our students in general if we give them strength to fight for their things then when they like it they will go for it i think it's again culture is the key and i'm positive and i think this is this is possible great great mariana thanks great great points all episode long appreciate it um john what about you yeah just closing thoughts is piggybacking on mariana's comment just that recruitment and uh i think specifically training if you have you know, maybe a coach with a little bit less qualifications, really working with them one on one, just because you want to put them in the position to have that visibility. The main focus of the article, you know, it's so important to keep female coaches within your program. But how are you working to keep them in your program? How are you working to better them? So those types of things are my main focus when I see any female coach interested in athletics. Fantastic. Great. OK, Kat. 
Yeah, drawing on what both John and Mariana said, I think if, if a coach fails, I feel that it's my fault because it's my duty to train to train that coach. So if there is a female coach, as he was saying, who doesn't feel confident enough, it's my job to to train them to be better and to know the rules and to know the game. So so the the onus is on me to to make that female coach better and more confident. Um, so my own, my other thought would be, you know, as a female coach, I need to keep representing. As a female AD, I need to keep finding female coaches so that there is an increase in representation. But I also um, like what Mariana was saying because she's so positive. I'm the same way, which is why I like Ted Lasso's, you know, be a goldfish, uh, because then you just tend to forget or gloss over all the all the negatives. Um, which is why I had a hard time finding, you know, remembering all the times that maybe there was a, a certain gender bias, but. But yeah, I like that too. So keep keep positive in in all of this and everything you do. Super, super. Yeah. Well, for me, I, I think just as to ads out there, if if this is an issue at your school and you're struggling to find female coaches, um, then as mentioned, make sure your admin know about it. Make sure that that's a need, right. um, and that they can go and and ask. You know, they don't have to recruit just for it, but a few questions in the application processes. You know, would you be interested in coaching? Have you coached before? What sports do you play? Um, is we'll, we'll go a long way for sure. So great. Well, um, thank you all three for this discussion on the on this article. Thank you, obviously, Laura and, and Sadie for allowing us to. Um, I wouldn't say critique the article because we all really enjoyed it, um, but just to discuss it and uh, and further and, and highlight it even more. Um, but we're not done. A uh, few more minutes left. Um, we're going to go to the school spotlight. Hear a bit more from John about the American School of Brasilia. So let's. Let's go to Brazil. <laughs> it's time for School Spotlight on Global Take, presented by School Rubric. Let's learn more about the stories and information from schools around the world. What's your school story? All right, well, welcome. This is uh, for EAB, or the Escola Americana do Brasilia. In 1961, we opened our doors to education. Throughout the years, EAB has continued to grow and transform into the special place that it is. We have 60, 660 students from 40 nationalities. Our complete staff is 187 people with 67 teachers and 28 teaching assistants. We offer the local Brazilian Ensino Medio Diploma, along with the commonly known IB Diploma and American High School Diploma. We're accredited by SACS and CASI and a member school of CIS. We belong to conferences called ASA and ASB. And this year, we're lucky enough to celebrate our 60th anniversary of the school. So school life and academics, what are they about? Students are always the main focus at EAD. Over the past two years, we've made new strides in welcoming students on campus and off campus. And as you can see at the bottom, Billy the Bull is a huge fan of many throughout the campus. Uh, we strive to have a community that values wellness. On the right is our organic market that was set up for our staff members this past month. And of course, we encourage our staff and students to live and look after their wellness as best they can, specifically also for the staff so they can deliver a high level instruction to our student body throughout the year. Some other factors of school life and academics, you know, our campus sits on close to Lake Paranoa, which is the top left picture. We have an excellent climate, even in the dry and rainy season, and it's quite dry right now. But EAB has a vision statement that teaches our community to positively impact the world through excellence, academic, excellence in academics, activities, arts, leadership, and service. We offer a variety of activities and athletic teams throughout the year, and our programs strive to give back to the EAB community into our communities outside of the walls through different service learning programs. Not to mention, we like to be as innovative, innovative as possible in our maker space. So life in the country, what is it about? Well, just two days ago, or yes, two days ago, Brazil's Independence Day was September 7th, and it was the 199th celebration by the Brazilians who declared separation from the United Kingdom of Portugal in 1822. Brasilia, though, was built in the late 1950s and named the third capital by President Huchelino Kubitschek on April 21st, 1960. The other previous capitals were Salvador and Rio de Janeiro. 
But in 1987, Brasilia became a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to its modernist architecture, as you can see in some of the top right pictures in the left side, and urban planning. Uh, the city was named the City of Design by UNESCO in October 2017 and has been a part of Creative Cities Networks also. Getting around may confuse you at first with all the acronyms and numbers, but it's such a special place through the design of Lucio Costa, Oscar Neymar, and others. All of Brazil offers incredible possibilities to explore nature and enjoy the beach. But Chapada dos Viadeiros National Park is a short car ride to see breathtaking cachoeiras or waterfalls as they call them. It's located about two to three hours outside of Brasilia, but within Brasilia in the greater area, outdoor activities like biking, water sports, and hiking can be found. And it's quite enjoyable in this futuristic city. So when the time is right, I encourage everyone to visit and enjoy the beautiful country, people, and culture of Brazil. Thank you, Global Take, for the opportunity to share more about EAB and Brasilia on the School Spotlight. Thank you for traveling across the globe with us to learn more about international schools. To hear more from international educators and learn more about these fantastic institutions, Tune in to our live Global Take episodes as we highlight international schools in our School Spotlight section presented by School Rubric. All right, uh, John, thanks. Thank you for taking the time to, to highlight your, your school EAB. And um, that will be a, a separate video published. So every episode we've had uh, great educators talking about their schools. And you can check all of those out uh, on the School Rubric YouTube page. Um, please go to that page anyway and check out their past episodes, all the other great things that uh, School Rubric has. Um, coming up next for Global Take will be September 23rd, so not next week, the week after, where uh, Laura and Sadie, the two authors of the article we talked about today, will be the hosts. Um, and they're going to be talking about LGBTQ plus educators and students. Okay, so uh, definitely uh, worth making a calendar entry for. and. Uh, coming back in two weeks on September 23rd. Uh, in the meantime, we have a Facebook group. Um, you can email us, contact if you want to be a guest, uh, if you want to uh, be on the show with us, uh, or just read out, reach out and ask any questions. So you see the group right there on Facebook. Um, so all that's left to say for me is uh, Kat, Mariana, and John, um, thank you very much for spending the time with us uh, today and being part of uh, Global Take. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks so much, Nick. Uh, this show does a good job of promoting, you know, female issues and, and every issue. So thank you for, for continuing to do that. You're very welcome. Thank okay. You. Everyone out there, thanks for tuning in. Um, like and subscribe and see you next time. Bye. Thank you for yeah. watching School Rubric on YouTube. Make sure that you like, follow and subscribe in order to stay looped in on all of our diverse collection of shows, interviews, panels, tutorials, and more from educators around the globe. And visit us at schoolrubric.com for even more great content, such as our online articles, Interact Magazine, featured podcasts, and more. Thank you.